Relationships. We're going to talk about relationships. How many of you know that um, you have relationships? Can I just see your hands in church? We, we all have some level of relationships. And if you have relationships, then where maybe we would all be the same today would be to say, I want to have better relationships. I, I don't think that we arrive as those who just have all relationships figured out. And the reason is because we're people who try to be in relationship or we do life with other people and we're changing and we're complicated, which means other people are changing and other people are complicated. Just so that we're all clear is even as we get started today, if you think other people are the only problem and it's not you, you're wrong. <laughs> it's all of us together. It's all of us together. Now, it is true, some of us might be a little bit more complicated than the other. Don't look at your spouse or your kids or your parents or your friends today. That is true. Uh, but, but we're all in this together, right? We all play a part. And so we're going to carve out three weeks uh, today and then a couple other communicators on our team speaking the next couple of weeks to learn how could we have better relationships. A couple points I want you to write down before I even break this down a little bit more that I hope that, that we would get. The first is the quality of my relationships determine the quality of my life. The quality of my relationships determine the quality of my life. Jesus said the greatest commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. That relationship with others, what you might call, you know, the, the peer to peer, the, 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 not the vertical to, to God, but the horizontal relationships with others others, how, how well I do interacting with the rest of humanity determines the quality of my life. So therefore, I think it can be said better relationships lead to a better life. Better relationships lead to a better life. If you think about the things that we're taught to study in school, I realize it's February, so our students in the room, like you're you're crushing it, you know? You're like, okay, second semester just started and I just love school. I know y'all love school and uh, we're glad for that. But you know what they don't teach us in school is how to have good relationships. And the truth is, if you wanna be successful in life, while geometry might be important for five of us, <laughs> relationships are what matters. Relationships are what actually leads to success. I'll talk about that in a moment. So that's why we're doing this message series. You know, often we study through the book of a Bible and then a couple times uh, in the year we'll dive into to a topic like this. And so we're gonna be looking at relationships from uh, three perspectives. Mark Batterson wrote a book uh, maybe a couple years ago called uh, Please Sorry Thanks. And so we're gonna look at those three words in this series, looking at one of those words each week. Before we do, let's talk about words. Words are an interesting thing because they help you have relationships or they help you destroy relationships. W words are the thing that all of us have. They're the thing that put all of us on an equal, uh, equal, that's a new word. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but we'll define it later. Somebody will send me a message with a definition of it, I'm sure. It puts all of us on an equal playing field. We all can bring words to the equation of our life. And here's the thing about words. Words create worlds and words destroy worlds. Our words are going to either create or they're going to destroy. This is true if you're seven, 17, 97, anywhere in the middle. Our words will create or our words will destroy. Proverbs chapter 18 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. I've said this many times if you've been a part of our church, you've heard me say it, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, is a complete lie. And it's caused us in life so often to devalue words, to both devalue the impact of hearing them and devalue the impact of saying them. If you think about even what's going on in the world we live in today, if we look at uh, university life, college, and the ideas that are being implanted in the generation that is in college, even the last 10 to 15 years. It's just words. 
words have literally transformed the direction of our nation in America the last 15 years. But if you just step back, words are what changes nations. Because words get in and plant ideas and then people move forward or people stay back based on ideas that were implanted through words. Words are so powerful. In fact, Proverbs 25 verse 11 says a word spoken at the right time is like gold apples in a silver, in silver settings. Now I don't really know exactly what gold apples in silver settings mean, but it's a good thing. You know it's true, like, right, you hear the word at the right time. Somebody gives you that compliment at the exact time, and you're like, let's go. I can run through a wall right now. So husband, if, 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 if my wife, if Megan tells me, you know, like, man, you're looking hot today, I'm like, let's go. <laughs> Whatever can do anything in the world right now, don't really care, we're going to win. You know, it's also true, somebody can say something to you and it cuts to your heart and all of a sudden you feel like you're a failure. There's nothing you could do to win. Why even bother? All from a simple word. The problem is that while we all have words, if we're not careful, we'll get careless with our words. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, what I think is maybe... I don't want to stretch this statement, but I think this might be one of the most um, sobering or like convicting, gut-wrenching two verses Jesus ever said. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. He said, I tell you, everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will be condemned. Now, I know reading those two verses, even some of you, let's, I'm going to be real. Some of you are like, I didn't know that was in the Bible. And that's okay. That's why we preach the Bible at a live church. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible. I read the Bible cover to cover every single year. And every year there's new verses that I feel like I've never read this before, right? Because you're always changing and it's coming alive in a different way. But clearly Jesus is making uh, not just a lackadaisical comment. He's like, listen, you need to know like your words that you just allow to come out of your mouth. You're going to stand before me and say, why did you say those things? And when you hear Jesus say that today, you go, hmm, I want to, Lord, help me. It's okay, right? This is in, I mean, I have definitely, you know, in 43 years of life, I'm like, I have said a lot of things (laughs) that I wish I wouldn't have said. (laughs) So this isn't a statement that, that, and and we'll see this in a few moments. This isn't a statement that says if you said something wrong that you're condemned. The Bible also says that the Lord looks at the heart. Man judges on the appearance. God judges on the heart. So there's this reality, as we'll see in a moment, that the words coming out of our mouth are a reflection of what's going on in our heart. And so there should be, as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, a transformation where our words actually become more honoring of God. And if our words are honoring of God, our words will be honoring of other people. Words come from the overflow of what's inside of us. Words come from the heart, the Bible says. They, they, come, from, they come from what's going on inside. And every one of us in the room has said this before. I didn't mean to say that. And the truth is, we just didn't mean for people to hear us say that. Because, because it came out because it's in our heart. It came out because maybe there was a little bit of bitterness, maybe there was a little bit of anger, maybe there was a little bit of frustration. All real emotions and real things we have that took hold of our heart, they became stronger in our heart than the love or than the compassion we have for that person. And we said something that as soon as it came out, we knew it was, was, was like a cutting remark. We knew it was hurting and we, we felt a little bit bad and we said we didn't mean to say that, but the truth was it's what was stirring in our heart. Jesus also said this in Luke 6, verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a good tree bear, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. 
So what I want you to see, even with this aspect, this opening of my message today, is that words really do matter. Jesus really does care about the words that come out of our mouth, and all of those words come from our heart. It's why Proverbs 4.23 is this verse we preach in messages multiple times a year. Sometimes there's those Bible verses that they're great tattoo verses, they're great refrigerator verses, they're great whatever, just to know them. Above all else, God says, guard your heart for everything flows from it. Everything. The words that you speak that create or destroy flow from your heart. So today, I want to talk about a word that if you want to have better relationships, we can get in our vocabulary and we can use it right and it will change us. And that word is sorry. I'm going to talk about sorry. Now, here's what's really exciting for me to preach a message today about the word sorry. Is I'm going to talk today about about this and from really a lot of personal growth and revelation. Because uh, one of the things I'm always thankful to God about is that uh, my, my style of preaching is that I preach to you, I, I share with you what I'm learning, what I'm walking through. And I'm thankful for that. Sometimes it means it's painful for me personally, but you know what? If we can all grow from my pain, it just makes me feel a little bit better in Jesus' name. And so I've learned that this is actually a thing I struggle with. And uh, in fact, I've been studying for this message for the past month. And what's good about that is I've been sick this week, so <laughs> I was ready, because I was ready to talk about what was in my heart on this concept of being a, a person who understands apology, on being a person who understands sorry. In fact, Megan said to me just yesterday that I've apologized more in the past month than in the 20 years combined. <laughs> I think she's just joking, though, so that's what I'm going to believe. <laughs> Here's the thing about the word sorry. It is, in a lot of our lives, either the most overused or underused word in our vocabulary. M most people y use this word sorry, uh, not, not most. People use this word sorry in one of those two ways. Some people use the word sorry, it's like, you walk in, and you're like, oh man, I have a hangnail. And you're like, I'm sorry. What? Did you rip my nail off? I just want to understand. Why are you sorry that I have a, a hangnail, right? Then some people, you bump into them. Maybe this just happens with me and my younger boys. They like, <laughs> could, could you say anything? How about sorry? To which the response is, it was an accident. <laughs> I don't care. Like, I don't understand. I, I think, I, I was trying to get a good illustration for us. That he, here's how I think we approach sorry. From, from one of two perspectives. Um, and I want to try to make this uh, m make sense. I, I think we approach it from the paper plate perspective. Just use it, just use it, just use it. That doesn't really matter. Or we approach it from the fine china perspective. Now, I'm really thankful uh, when, when Megan and I got married in 2004, we made what was a controversial decision during our wedding registry. And that controversial decision was that we were not going to register for fine china. There was a lot of judgment from the older generation about this decision that we were making in that moment. <laughs> what are you going to do around the holidays? How will you guys eat? What will you serve the food on? What is going to actually happen? You know what I'm saying? Like it was, it was a significant moment where we had to stand strong, together, united, against all of our family that was older than us. But we chose to go with a strong, solid everyday use plate. This is what I think our sorry should be. It's not just, oh yeah, I just throw it out all the time. Yeah, I don't paper plates. Who cares? Oh, you ripped it. Who cares? Get a new one. But it's also not fine china that it comes out once a year 
and yet it cost more than your wardrobe. It's useful every day, yet it's quality, it's sturdy, and it matters. This is how we need to think about being a people who are quick to apologize, who understand that we aren't failures if we say we're sorry. In fact, the truth is we're actually, I I would say, winning. We're successful if we can do this because the reality that, that I'm consistently reminded of is to be sorry requires personal responsibility. To be sorry requires personal responsibility. Most of us would rather blame other people for our problems. It doesn't matter if we actually say that, that's just the internal reality most of us deal with. If I have a situation, this, if I have a situation as pastoring this church, if something doesn't go the way that I want it to go, my instinct is to go, who on the team can I blame that didn't do what they were supposed to do? Then I have to stop and number one go, that's terrible leadership. <laughs> and I have to go, what, what, what part did I play? What is my responsibility With my, in my marriage? When, when there's conflict, when there's tension, everything that would be my instinct is I want to go, this is, this is, my wife needs to do this better and different. This is all her fault. No personal responsibility. Also, that's not true. With my kids, kids with their parents, we want to just blame the other one and take no responsibility. This is all of our natural instincts. And if we lean into that natural instinct, it will cause us to be a people that aren't quick to say sorry. It'll cause us to be a people who are quick to blame the other one. If sorry becomes a part of our vocabulary, it doesn't make us a sorry person. It actually will make us a successful person. It's being self-aware. It's knowing what it's like to be on the other side of you and taking that into account. Just a couple of real practical things as well as we continue. When you do say sorry, this is how it works. You start the sentence like this. I am sorry, I. Just want to help all of you right now in your marriage, with your employees, with your kids, with your friends, with your parents. When you apologize, you say, I am sorry, I. Because it's personal responsibility. You are apologizing for yourself. Not, you need to write this down, not, I am sorry, you. Some of you are like, this is very practical, different teaching than Pastor Michael usually does. Yes, it is. I'm trying to really, really help your relationships. Because I know plenty of Adults, I won't even put a number on the age, (laughs) that lead with, I'm sorry, you. And if you're like me, sometimes you say, I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry, I meant to say, I'm sorry, I. Because it's got to be this quick realization that if I'm actually apologetic, it's not because of something you did. It's because of something I did. It's got to get to what's actually going on inside. Mark Batterson says this, your sorry is only as powerful as your motives are pure. Which is why we can't use it as a paper plate word. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Which is why parenting, by the way, this is super um, challenging sometimes, is we we want to teach our children to say sorry so they make a mistake and we go, say you're sorry. And they go, sorry. Are they actually sorry? No. But you said say you're sorry. So then you're like, well, I, they need to say sorry. Yes. But they, they also need this coaching and teaching that says, here's the reason you're saying sorry. is because there's this understanding, this realization that we need to have that your actions negatively impacted someone else, that your words negatively impacted someone else. And so we want to have a feeling about that that causes us to put the other person above our selves. At the end of the day, the main reason some of us struggle with this is because we're more focused on ourselves than we are on others. And I, I think that you're the problem, not me. So therefore, if I say I'm sorry, I'm making me the problem, not you. 
And so we need a little humility. We all need to grow in humility. If you think you're humble, you're not. We all need to grow in humility. It's the most interesting trait, characteristic of a Christian. The moment you think you might be doing decent at it, you just went back to square one. You know, it's like, well, I think I'm pretty humble. Dang it. <laughs> not at all. Okay, let's try this again. C.S. Lewis is the one who famously said that humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's not a devaluing of yourself. It's actually a valuing of yourself because you don't have to prove that you have value and worth because you know your identity is found in Christ. Therefore, you have identity and you have worth and therefore you can care about the needs of others. You can live with a little bit more empathy. Empathy. Empathy is difficult sometimes for people like me. And what I mean when I say that is Sometimes when you're the kind of person who's like, I can, I can have a vision and like, let's go. And I'm just like, it's going to be incredible. And if we're not careful, we can forget, oh, I need to actually interact with people in a good way. It's being very honest with you today. So we've got to grow because it's not okay. I'm so grateful for years of counseling. And uh, I, I see my counselor either once or twice a month just to like, Help me keep being better <laughs> because we're always discovering like, what is it about me? What's it like to be on the other side of me? How do I need to grow? So empathy is a huge thing. I wanted to give you this, uh, this empathy map came across this past week. And so this empathy map gives you some questions to ask to help you understand how to respond in a situation. Because what's true is all of us are in situations when we can tell, right, something maybe isn't great, maybe something isn't right. In empathy maps, ask these questions. What do they think? What do they feel? What do they see? What do they hear? What do they say? And what do they do? It's this picture to take a break and take a moment in your marriage with your friend, with your kids, coworkers, bosses, people especially you're in relationship with, and before being quick to make a determination that you know what the problem is or that you know how to solve it, instead to step back and go, wait, what's, what's the complexity of everything that's going on with them right now? And, and this is where it can be challenging, especially for some of us today who maybe we we would consider ourselves um, leaders or problem solvers because we like to skip this step and just tell you what to do to fix your problem. It's a lack of empathy. When we have that lack of empathy, we're not actually trying to know what's wrong or going on with you, what is bothering you from our actions or what is bothering you in general. Instead, we just step in and we want to make sure we solve the problem. Without empathy, apologies are empty. Saying it without meaning it isn't the answer. We have to understand. It's this human reality. Dale Carnegie wrote this many years ago. About 15% of one's financial success is due to one's technical knowledge. And about 85% is due to skill in human engineering. Geometry human relationships. Like it's really great, you know, if we can work a spreadsheet, which it really is great if you can work a spreadsheet. But how can you relate to people? Do we see people? Do we care about people? According to Goldman's EQ theory, um, I'm gonna shorten this for time. He, he talks about just, right, your emotional quotient, your emotional health, your understanding of others. And he says, people that have a high EQ, people that would have empathy, people that understand others, people that are thinking about others, they know precisely how their mental state influences the emotional reactions of those around them. People know how what's going on in my mind actually impacts the emotions of my spouse, of my kids, 
of my employees, my coworkers, of my boss. Your mind, your, your heart, right, it dictates what you're like, which then does have a reaction to the emotions of others. And we have to be careful here because we are responsible for our own emotions. But if someone is being a jerk to us, that matters. So I want to know, what, how am I impacting the people in my life? Am I impacting them positively or negatively? And I want to be okay with when I get feedback that says, hey, this wasn't necessarily super Super positive. Just a moment of ultimate vulnerability I want to share with you right here. I, I realized a couple of months ago that one of the reasons I have struggled in my, in my history with being quick to say sorry is because I have, I have some shame and, uh, and what happens when you have some shame, shame is the lie you believe that you're not good. Right? Guilt is when you believe you did something not good. A feeling of shame is when you think it's your identity is not good. And so I realized that there's been seasons of my life or there's times of my life when the reason I would struggle to apologize is because I think saying sorry confirms that I'm not good. So if I just withhold my sorry, then I can keep the blame on you and I don't have to take any personal responsibility and be perceived as the one who actually isn't good. So it's this internal lie that can manifest in any of our lives where we think taking responsibility for something we did actually makes us less than. Which just, again, bluntly has been what's been so great and healthy for me the last couple of months. And maybe you're like, you just figured that out. And I'm like, yes, thank you for letting me be your pastor. Please don't leave the church. I'm a work in progress. You know what I'm saying? That's just the way it is. But it's so freeing and it's so healthy because I would have always told you like, you know, I don't have shame. Like I'm a confident person. And I do think that I'm a confident person. But the moment I start to think my confidence is in me, And instead of in God is the moment it becomes scary to take personal responsibility. To be sorry requires personal responsibility. That's self-awareness. And I promise you this, in your marriage, in your relationship with your friends, coworkers, again, all the people closest to us, what we need from each other is the other one to take personal responsibility. We cannot fix each other. Like, we can't fix each other. But with God's help, we can fix ourselves. You can't change your spouse. You can't change your parents. You can't change anybody. But you can be honest and you can be vulnerable. Brene Brown says, staying vulnerable is a risk we have to take if we want to experience connection. It's to be okay saying, man, I'm sorry that hurt you. I'm sorry. I suck for doing this, 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 this. Because if you just stay general with your sorry, you aren't changing anything. You know, it's just like when we talk to God and we're like, God, Please forgive me for all my sins. Amen. Well, okay, I mean, on the cross, he did die for the sins of humanity. But repentance is when we come with a heart that is remorseful, that is sorry, when we say, God, please forgive me for the explosion that I had towards my kids today. I didn't demonstrate what you're like to them. Please forgive me. Sorry is when we then talk to our kids and we say, I'm really sorry that I yelled at you and reacted that way. You didn't deserve that. You didn't earn that. That's not what I should be like towards you. I want you to know that I'm really sorry. And I'm doing things and I'm working hard to not be like that. That it's specific. The truth is, do you, the, the question is, do you want to have better relationships or not? 
because we can just keep pushing the blame on others. But the more we grow in personal responsibility and self-awareness because we're like, I know I'm kind of a lot. So therefore, I want to think about what is this like for this person in my life? And am I helping them by putting their feelings above mine? Am I willing to be vulnerable and stop protecting myself? Your pain can't be healed if you're committed to protecting it. Like the pain of your past, guilt, shame, your pain can't be healed if you're committed to protecting it. So you just be quick to say, I'm sorry. It strengthens every relationship in your life. You know, my relationships that have been strengthened over the past several years, I've shared this before, but two guys in my core, my best friends, you know, men in their 40s, and, and multiple times, I'll, you know, I've called, I've texted in person, talk, and I'm just like, hey, I'm sorry that I did this. I don't know. I, I don't know if you took it that way, but I just want to make sure you know I didn't mean to do that, and I'm sorry. And the first time I did it several years ago, I was like, men don't do this. this we're men. And I'm just like, it is so awesome having relationships where you aren't trying to protect and be something, but instead you could be honest and be vulnerable and be quick to go, I want to be the kind of friend. I want to be me. I want to be a friend. I want to be a husband. I want to be a dad. I want to be a pastor where people know I care about them. And when, I, when, I'm, in, when I'm living or doing something in a way that has a negative impact, I want to be quick to apologize because that's not what I desire. We apologize because we care more about the other person we care more about the relationship than about being right. Could we today in church on this Sunday just go, you know what? I don't have to be right. I'm good not being right. I don't care if I'm right. Come on, downtown Suffolk, Western Branch, those of you online, just go ahead. It's okay. Be like, it's, I want you to hear yourself feel it. Say, I don't have to be right. I don't, ha I don't have to be right. I don't have to win every argument with my spouse. I, I don't have to be right. I'm not a failure if I'm not right. It takes incredible courage. It takes incredible courage to care more about the relationship than about being right. Because you have to realize you're not trying to gain value in yourself. You already have value set in place. So just a couple final quick thoughts, which means nothing, the word quick. <laughs> the reason sorry is so important. Saying sorry sets you free. Because you're like, I'm not, I don't, I don't have to wonder. You know how when you're like mad at somebody and you know maybe this has never happened to any of you, you know how like when you're mad at somebody that you're close to and you know you're kind of being not nice to them? Like you know it, but you don't want to, you don't want to apologize and you don't want to not do it, but you're kind of mad at them, but then you're also mad at yourself because of how you're at. And you're just like, I'm, you're not free at all. But like, there's this small part of you, <laughs> but if I apologize, they win. So I'm just not, I can't. <laughs> And then if I let them win, they're going to think they can just do this all the time. I can't let that happen because I'm God. <laughs> Sorry sets you free. Withholding it is because you're trying to put yourself in the position of God. That's not a spot you or me were ever meant to try to live. That's a weight we were never meant to try to carry. Because while coming with that heart will set you free, understand this, forgiveness keeps you free. Forgiveness keeps you free. 
Forgiven people forgive people. It's part of our identity as Christians. Because Jesus forgives us, we can be free to forgive others. Which I didn't say this earlier, but just again, real practical coaching of how this works in your relationships. When someone comes to you and says, I'm sorry, the correct response is, I forgive you. The correct response is not, it's okay. The correct response is not, it's no big deal. The correct response is not, it doesn't really matter. When you respond to an apology with those words, you devalue the other person and their apology. I never got taught this in school, all the way through seminary. (laughs) Why are relationships so hard? Because we don't really know how to do them. Be fast to forgive. Be quick to say sorry. How often should we forgive? Well, Jesus taught us that, Matthew chapter 18. Peter's all worked up. Everybody keeps making mistakes. How long, how many times should I keep forgiving? All these losers that just keep making all these mistakes in my life, Jesus. I added a couple words there. Just so you know, they're not in the actual translation. Jesus said, I tell you, Matthew 18, I tell you, you don't just forgive them seven times. (laughs) but 77 times. Some translations, 70 times seven. I just, he's just like, just keep, when you feel like you don't have any more forgiveness to give, guess what? There's a little bit more. And why does it matter so much? Well, remember what I said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, what might be two of the most sobering words Jesus ever spoke. He said, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna judge you when you stand before me one day on the words you use. If they're, if they're wasted words or worthy words, you know, I'm like, okay, that's a lot. But in Matthew chapter six, I don't think this verse is gonna be on the screens, but in Matthew chapter six, Jesus said this. If you don't forgive others, your heavenly father won't forgive you. Well, but I just need them to do a little bit of repair work. No, no. The forgiveness is is what keeps you free. What happens in a relationship, in the full restoration of relationships when there's been significant damage is not the same thing as the need to be quick to apologize and quick to forgive. There's also work to do to repair the things that happen in those scenarios. But when I come with the right heart, I'm set up to be the person who actually experiences what God has. So for for me personally, and for us as a community, we wanna have healthy relationships. We wanna be in small groups having healthy relationships where we're vulnerable, where we're honest, where we're strengthening each other, where we're quick to be those who actually live the way Jesus called us to live. And we can only do it because Jesus forgave us. When you know you have nothing to prove, nothing at all to prove, you are free to say sorry and to forgive. And so across the room today, I just wanna take a simple moment. I wanna pray for each of us. I wanna do two things. I wanna pray for our relationships to be stronger. And I wanna pray for people in the room today that you need the forgiveness that Jesus offers. Because when we don't know we've been forgiven by God, it's hard to forgive others. Because we're carrying something that Jesus wants to carry for us. Doesn't make life easy, but it does mean we can live free. So you close your eyes with me as we pray today. God, I pray right now. I pray for every person in the room who God, we, we, we need your help with relationships. Lord, we need, we need your help to be quick to apologize, to be quick to forgive. We need your help to be more empathetic towards our spouse or our kids or our parents or coworkers or friends. Lord, we need your help. And I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, you would strengthen us, you would equip us right now across this room. I ask you today, Lord, we would have stronger marriages, stronger family relationships, stronger friendships, 
stronger relationships in our jobs because we truly understand we don't have to prove ourselves, we don't have to gain identity, that we can be quick to live out our life this way. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray for those in the room right now. Lord, there's, there's many sitting in the room right now. God, they're not sure they've fully been forgiven by you. They still carry some guilt that some sins or some different things haven't been forgiven, haven't been washed away. God, I'm thinking about people in the room right now that you're stirring their heart and they've heard this message and they have mainly been thinking about how they need to get their life right with you, how they need a fresh start, how they need to go all in for you. Would you speak to their heart right now, Jesus? If you're here today as you hear my voice and you know you find yourself in a spot where you need you need to know that you know you've been forgiven by Jesus. You need to make a commitment today to follow him. You need to give your heart to him. You need to stop trying to do it on your own. Stop carrying the weight of the world, but instead to go all in to follow Jesus with your whole entire life. If that's you here today and you can say, I today, right now, I want to commit to follow Jesus. I've not been following him, but right now in this moment, I want to commit to him, to follow him, to receive forgiveness Would you lift your hand up in the air? Just right now, across the room, if that's you, say, right now, I'm gonna commit. I have not been. I'm gonna go all in. I'm gonna receive his forgiveness right now. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for how you're moving on these men and women's hearts. Thank you, God, for forgiveness. You can put your hands down. God, I pray for every person who raised their hand. Lord, I thank you that you give us the strength to follow through. Lord, I thank you that following you is the best life we can live. Now, all together, would you repeat this prayer after me? Those who raised your hands, all those who are all in around the room, say, Jesus, please forgive me. I've gone my own way. But today, I've decided to go your way. I thank you that as I follow you, I can live fully alive. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching. If this message impacted you in any way, we encourage you to like and share it out. We post new messages every single week, so subscribe if you haven't already. You can also watch past messages, all geared towards helping you live fully alive. And to stay up to date with everything going on at Alive Church, follow us on social media or visit our website, livefullyalive.com.